Well, welcome everybody. So as I was saying, um, I'm going to walk through what I think is going to be helpful for you guys if you're looking for, you know, investment and funding. Um, and also if you are have already got some some angel investing seed money or self-funded, that this is the playbook that I think is going to help you in seeing um, what the investors are looking for or what is the next level if you are actually looking for more funding. And in general, if you don't need funding, this is also a great way for you to be more profitable and actually see how do you can reach more of the, the right customers and then you can gain paying customers. Okay, so the key takeaways here is like understanding what the growth hacking is from the start of your business and throughout the whole stage of your company. Now, I believe that growth starts on day one, period. Hands down, nobody even, you know, you'll hear some growth hackers will be like saying the fun gets started, like literally when you set everything up, then we start growing businesses, uh, growing more of your business and getting more of the customers and actually doing the fun stuff, the A-B testing, all that stuff. There are different types of growth hackers. There's plenty of different um, types of you know, individuals that you're going to look at different stages. So you need somebody who actually understands that growth starts on day one. That means your business model, how you set things up, your process, everything where people may not consider as fun is the most crucial part. How can you actually have, a, you know, build a gigantic sky rise, like high rise when you don't have the foundation built in the bottom and you have somebody who's just, you know, building really quickly and more robust on the middle or the top of the building, it will crumble down if you don't have anything down in the foundation. And have I had companies where they're profitable since day one? Absolutely. So I'm gonna be covering, you know, not only for like, if you're just B2B, you might be to B2C, um, it could be any type of business model. This should actually be the foundation for you to actually look as a playbook. And the second one is how do you effectively build this growth engineering process and how do you experiment it to scale for sustainable growth? A lot of individuals will focus on like, how can I show growth? And really it's not sustainable. And how do you impact, um, you know, the growth in the early stages and not just focus only on growth marketing. You think that growth hacking is only marketing, but actually growth hacking is about growing the entire business. Um, because at the end of the day, when you hear a growth hacker, um, you have to understand they're hacking ways to grow a business. That means you're finding ways that are the most efficient and most resourceful way that actually has the highest impact. So that comes from startup because you have low resources, low monetary uh, ways to fund it, that you become more creative and resourceful in that way. And therefore, it's not always marketing. It could be product that you have to focus on growth. Obviously, the hottest new word right now is product-led growth. But don't get caught up so much that it's like the new latest fashion and that to this year, it will be product-led growth. Next year, it will be engineering-led growth. Really understand that your entire company is like an entire ship. And you're being a really great growth hacker. You should be the compass and map to the captain of the ship. Or if you are the captain's ship, which is the CEO or the founder, you should be able to understand the direction that you're going. And I will get into detail on that in a bit. And then the third takeaway is how do you experiment across the three pillars of growth? I've been able to simplify a lot of the complicated things that you see online where you're just like, okay, this is very overwhelming. Um, I see this company's doing this. Let's go do that. Just because it works for that company doesn't necessarily works for you, even though they may be in the same industry. That is the biggest um you know, downfall that a lot of uh, companies and startups will look at their competitors and try to emulate that. And just because it works for them, just understand that they are started at a certain time, um, you know, and they could have started like, you know, a couple months before. And that couple months before is a little bit different than today's time. So think about like companies that actually was like, you know, doing really well before the pandemic and actually did not do so well after the pandemic. And so you have to really look at the fact that, you know, what are the ways to define the product market fit in your industry at a certain time? And then the fourth one is how do you achieve quick learning so that you can actually iterate this process? Because at the end of the day, you, you know, could do a three, six, nine and 12 month you know, roadmap, which a lot of individuals do because it has to be given to the investors when you're pitching, um, you know, to get funding or whatever that you're doing that you're trying to um, talk to your current investors, right? That'd be all grand and dandy. But the thing is, during the, you know, one to three month or even during one week or two weeks from now, do you even know what direction you should be going? How do you make the best decision so you can arrive at your three month 
like roadmap, right? Because a lot of people actually grab numbers out of nowhere and sometimes say, and they really believe that this is where they're gonna reach. So the point being is being able to understand how to sail your ship, your business ship, in a way that you're not looking three months from now, how can you survive between now in 24 hours or now until the end of the week? So being able to be really quick to adapt to the changes to the weather and the, you know, the environment and how customers behave. They may love you this hour, next week they may not love you. So how do you respond to that? So that's the reason why it's so critical to look at how the pandemic changed. And as an example, um, is in the fact that the companies that survive are the ones who adapt quickly to change and actually respond to the needs of your end consumer. So let's define what is growth hacking. So growth hacking, you know, a lot of people always claim like it's growth marketing or now it's product led growth. It's always focused on product. And that's the main place you have to look at. I'm going to give you other examples like, you know, HubSpot. They started out as sales led growth and now they're product led growth. So don't just get caught up whatever the media says, because I'm going to give you an example just because like, for example, two plus two is four. 3 plus 1 is 4, 5 minus 1 is 4, 6 minus 2 is 4. No matter what, how you approach it, everyone wants to get to 4. But just because someone did 6 minus 2, that's not the only way to do it. Okay, so when you hear product-led growth, yes, it's very important, but doesn't mean you neglect everything else, and that is the most important thing. It's just the hottest new tr um, topic right now. Everything comes down to semantics. People say growth hacking isn't real. It's all like, you know, it's a quick fix, and, you know, it's magic and stuff. They'll start using demand generation, lead generation. You're going to get confused. At the end of the day, you only have to focus on two things that is on your mind. Get a lot of customers, increase revenue. Bottom line, that is it. If you don't care about customers and revenue, you are just a hobby. And hobbies are great, but that's not where you're going to be able to get when you're actually trying to get investors or actually try to be more profitable and not get, you know, a VC money or anything like that. So let me define this. Here is a ship. This ship is literally your business, okay? When you're looking at this as your business, and this is a vintage ship where you have to paddle through each of the department here. Um, it's like marketing, product, engineering, sales, finance, human resource, customer success, and it can go on and on in whichever department you have that is specific to your business. So each of these um, departments are paddling across to move the ship forward, okay? And if marketing goes at 65 miles per hour, and then you have product going at 50, which is fine, it's around the same ballpark, but then you have sales not picking up the paddle at all, and engineering rowing backwards. If someone is rowing backwards, someone's going forward, you know your ship is not moving. If it's not moving, you're stuck in the middle of the ocean with no landmarks and nowhere to go. This is where most company get stuck because you're feeling that you're moving, you're working hard, but what you end up doing is being stuck because no, um, none of the departments is actually communicating with each other. Now, if you're a smaller company, obviously the ship will get smaller. And if you are a solo founder, obviously you are everything in this paddle. You do everything, but the problem is you'll get exhausted. So how do we actually end up growing so that you don't work hard, but you actually build a great growth engine? So let's define this first. Now that everyone's like understanding that we all have these paddles and it has to flow in, you know, uh, sync. You don't want to be always running below deck and telling the captain of the ship, which is on the left. On the right with the one, the star is the North Star, which is the growth hacker. The growth hacker is the compass and map to the captain of the ship. Again, if your company is smaller, you could be this growth hacker. So with that said, you don't want to run below deck and say, hey, marketing, what's going on? Engineering, what's going on? Product, are you doing this? Or sales. The problem here is each of the department is, is in silo. And you're trying to pump all this data out, give it to the captain of the ship. And it could be the founder who's the captain of the ship or the VP or the director, depending on the size of your company. It doesn't necessarily have to be the founder, whoever's leading the ship at the time. Hey, so Kel, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Your slides aren't moving. I think you're sharing the wrong screen. Am I not? Oh, you're what am I sharing? sharing? But, um, we see like the, um, it's in basically edit mode. Oh. There you go. That's weird. Okay. Uh, I guess it's, um, all right. I guess you guys will see it this way instead of, hold on. Oh, this entire time I was showing you all this stuff. So, all right. So let me do this. 
the entire screen. Does that work better? View. And just put that into um, slideshow mode. That's the little, it looks like the, there you go. Oh, all right. I've been doing slideshow this entire time. All right. So here okay. is, uh, so you guys didn't see this, um, is your business. And I was mentioning marketing, product, engineering, sales, finance, human resource, and customer success. It could actually go to other departments if you, you have a certain niche in your company. Now, it should be paddling, um, like I mentioned to you, all forward so that it can move forward. If it doesn't, you know, one paddle goes backward, one doesn't pick up the paddle, you know, that's where there's a disconnect there. And this is the reason why a lot of companies get stuck is because the problem is each of the department is trying to give data to the captain of the ship or the growth hacker. And then at the end of the day, the captain of the ship and the growth hacker is trying to piece all the puzzles together. Each department thinks they have delivered what they, uh, you know, the head of the ship requires. But then the next step is trying to piece how does marketing affect product? How does product affect engineering? And how sales and marketing? The thing is, a lot of times marketing says, I send you all the leads and sales were like, you gave me terrible leads. And then sales start fighting with marketing, not doing their job. And marketing says, not my job that you didn't know how to close it. The thing is, it has to be about growth. You have to think about how do you get customers and revenue in each department? You have to think beyond your job in that one paddle. You have to look at the whole ship. So you have to constantly understand that how do you get all those paddles into the dashboard in such a way that you don't have to run exhaustingly down below deck and that you want to arrive at the North Island with a pot of gold. So with that, you know, that is the job of the growth hacker. There's each of um, every time you land at, a, you know, a, an island with a pot of gold, there's another island you have to go to. These are each of your milestones that you hit on your roadmap. But understand that sometimes there's turmoil, there's different environmentals that is taken off guard, like pandemic, or you have, you know, a situation that your, you know, product isn't needed anymore and you have to adapt to that storm. How do you adapt to it? So you have to respond quickly or else you'll sink. Or you have pirates, which I consider more of attacks of reputation, your um, competitors. How do you respond to that? If you can survive all that, you're able to go to your first milestone. But in order to get to the island and not stuck in like the middle of the ocean, you have to be able to understand your coordinates. You have to be able to control what's inside your ship. I've always said 95% of what's inside your ship can be controlled. Other things that are outside of your ship, it's a little bit harder. However, being able to understand what's going on inside your ship, being able to sail in such a way and responding to what's going out and actually hearing what the customers are wanting and how they're responding to that, you're able to have a little bit more control than someone who doesn't understand it. So that's growth hacking. Now, to deep dive even further, uh, growth hacking is really a process of rapid experimentation across all funnels, right? All the departments here. And I, you know, most people always default to growth marketing. It's not always about marketing. If you don't have the right product and it's not built in a way, the user experience, you're obviously going to lose them when they're in there. So you can have the best marketing and best acquisition, but the hardest part is retention. You want them to come back, continue to use them and use you and also refer you to other people. That's why I call them as marketing soldiers. They're paying you, but also at the same time, advocating for you for uh, to get more customers. So if you're in the middle of the ocean and literally the wind is blowing at every second differently than it was, you know, the last hour, knowing that you can look at someone else's, you know, framework, it is only for a framework for you to guide you, but not actually a blueprint. So know that having this rapid experimentation helps you understand like, should I make a few steps, you know, go north a few steps here, or should I make a little pivot and go northwest for a little bit? So this is why it's so important to do rapid experimentation, but not go crazy in such a way that you're wasting time and doing all this A-B testing, multivariate testing. At the end of the day, you're actually not moving at all. So your goals here at the end of the day, what is this all about, right? Because at the end of the day, your investors are trying to give you their money because they believe in your ideas and goals and how you're going to achieve it, how you're going to solve the problem and make the world a little bit better. So, but they also want bottom line, are you actually getting visibility, right? They're giving you money. You're not going to be wasting this and being stuck in the middle of the ocean and not being able to respond. So getting visibility so that people can see what you're building. You can build the best things in sliced bread and people don't know about it or even understand what you're saying. That's why messaging is so important. 
as part of marketing. That's why getting visibility is important there. And then acquiring a strong user base that once you acquire them and get them in, which is the easiest part, getting them in that's strong enough that other people are like, what's going on? I want to be a part of that too. Let me have a trial or maybe actually let me see what's, you know, I want to be a part of that network as well. And then making sure that once they're in there, you convert them into sales. This is the simplest way of looking at growth hacking the first three. Obviously, there's more, but to make it simple, this is what I would actually look and target if you're actually looking to see, you know, funding or actually just making it profitable for your business. Now, everyone's seen this famous growth curve before. In the very beginning, you want to be more um, strategic and you're trying to be have more sustainable growth. And then all of a sudden, there's unsustainable tactical growth here. That means basically paid ads. There's some actually, you know, um, a famous person helping you press. All that is spikes. Understand that those are temporary. Don't get into those vanity uh, metrics, but vanity metrics are still important because it's also a measure of some type of metrics to see how customers are responding, but it is not the end all be all. So that's what they mean when they say vanity metrics, but don't think that that should be disregarded at all. Okay. And moving on, what is the growth framework that I, uh, actually have made it successful for me to actually help respond to, uh, investors who have already invested in companies I worked with, um, and also how this can benefit you for um, when you're pitching. So this is a growth framework, and I want you to look at two layers because it can be very overwhelming. If you can answer any of these questions, um, you know, when you're going through these layers, this is going to help you get more funding. Also, literally, funding is not always all success unless you're in specific um, industry that requires a little bit more heavy capital in the very beginning, such as SaaS. But if you're in a, a different business that maybe that you can actually be profitable since day one, and that you're able to actually take that money and invest it back into the company, that's even better for you, because then you can actually do a little bit more um, experimentations without uh, being stuck with whatever partnership you have with investors. Also, that's very important that I do let you know that um, when you're selecting who you're in being invested by, that they have the same mindset as you and making sure that the terms are exactly what you are signing up for. It is literally a marriage, a partnership that has to be uh, cohesive throughout the entire term. So Layer one is typical. What you get is acquisition, engagement, retention, referral, and monetization. And then obviously layer two, what are the analytics and insights and technology? If you separate these two, then you're going to be able to under understand and break this down. So, you know, you will do retargeting, ownership, conversion, and international, how you're going to target that. If you're only doing domestic, then obviously you can just delete this part until a little bit later. So acquisition, typical, these are top, you know, little items here that you want to focus on PR, SEO, content marketing, and performance marketing with paid ads. Um, and then engagement, you know, how do you get that activation, onboarding, lifecycle marketing, and any activity notifications and creating a community, obviously. And then referral, how you do, you know, invite friends, social sharing prompts, this might not apply to you. Again, I'm actually speaking this more industry agnostic, because you guys could be, you know, either a mobile app, you could be more consumer based. But if you're more, um, you know, B2B, you can do it in a different way. Like, you know, instead of saying invite friends, it could be rewarding, um, you know, business referrals or something like that. Um, or actually inviting their consumers to actually do certain things that is in your, you know, business model. And then how do you monetize this? Actually understanding how to, you know, have payment processing. What is the pricing model? I'm going to tell you, uh, on average, uh, companies spend about six hours on pricing and total for the whole month. And it's surprising, right? And most customers spend more than hours, six hours. They spend weeks, sometimes months to define what that pricing is and what their budget is. So the biggest lack that I see in a lot of companies and startups is that they don't spend enough time on pricing. So I would actually suggest highly, whatever your business model is, to understand what that pricing is, how the payment processing is, and more of a smooth user experience in um, collecting that monetization model that you have. 
All right, moving on is that analytics and insights. Understand like what are you measuring? Understand the sentiment, the A-B testing, multivariate. How are you accounting for user segmentation? And we can go down and deeper in that. Don't get caught up because of all these little uh, items here. You can make it as simple as possible just to understand the tracking. It's basic insights of like, are you going in the right direction? You know, just when you were doing science projects back in the day, you know, there's a hypothesis. You're doing some testing to see if you're in the right direction. Or if you get lost in the, the forest and are you taking the few steps forward to making sure this is the right direction or is it dangerous to go in this direction because there are some dangerous animals. So you have to make tiny little steps to basically to give you insights if you're in the right direction. If you continue to go blindly, you might go too far that you have to go backtrack and that's not what you want. So the whole point here is to get insights so you know that you're going in the right direction. And then at the end of the day, don't go all heavy and crazy about which technology stack that you should be using. You should only purchase and leverage yourself with technology so that it can actually make you more efficient and go um, and grow. That is the whole point. Don't just think that a, having a tech stack will make you more successful. And there's a lot of tech stack that are uh, affordable and free. So you might want to look at Product Hunt. There's a lot of companies that are building out that are a little bit more adaptable to today's times. That's something that you see. Monday.com is out there for collaboration. It might be expensive to some companies. And there are alternatives such as, you know, in start infinity to startinfinity.com, where you play a one flat rate and you have it until you die, literally. Uh, so that's an example there. So finding really awesome startups to support them as well as using them to support your own company. So this is an overview of the framework so that you understand that how this growth framework works. And then in what is the experimentation across the three pillars of growth? So I want you to know that you can simplify this after knowing those two layers, that these are the things that you need to focus on. Product at the end of the day, that's your bread and butter. What are you selling? If you're a service, let's say, then that's your middle part. That's what you're selling. That's why people are here and coming to you. But people only understand what that is. What is your branding? They have to have an emotional connection or they have to understand what you're selling about. Make it so simple that they get it, that they realize, oh my God, where's you been all my life and that this is going to help my business, especially if it's B2B. B2C, it's a different type of tactic of how you make them want it and need it at the same time. And analytics is basically knowing if you're in the right direction and actually responding quickly when your customers are actually diverting in a different direction. So again, these are the items. You can go through each of the items on how to respond to each of these three pillars. If you do that, you have to experiment all across three pillars, analyze, identify, and prioritize, and test. Then you're able to understand if you're a product market fit at any point that you may not, like you may lose that product market fit if you don't understand these three parts. And then what is the growth engine? To wrap this up is basically once you're able to identify which direction you're going, you're actually going to inject engines in it, right? This engine is actually to help you grow and eventually scale. This is where the long term is, but also you can inject this early on. If you build it in the very beginning, this is your foundation. This is what investors like to see. These are uh, also for your sake as well to actually scale and get a lot of revenue. So basically three parts of the growth engine, get it sticky, viral, and paid. Sticky means people want to come back and want to use it again and make it viral in such a way people love and talk about it. And then what are the paid when you need to inject paid ads into it? So this is your product. And these are the different levels of each of the departments of your business. And the product reaches to the customers. And in the product, there's a website and landing pages. You want it flow into the product. Why do we have landing pages versus a website? It's not a versus, but it's both. Website is basically generally speaking to what your product is about. Landing pages is speaking to specific customers. And then, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. I apologize. So to prevent running long, especially because the next speaker has a, has a hard stop, um, what I would ask is everybody, if you have questions for Carol, um, or would like to see more of her, her slides, please connect with her on LinkedIn um, or her other socials, and um, she will be able to, to get you any questions answered, any information that you need. I'm so sorry I had to cut you off, but we, you know, we're going to run at risk of, of going long. Um, oh, okay. I'm going to cut it short here. So basically, it's just a flow of the growth engine. Um, but if you guys want to connect with me, here's my information 
Um, I guess we had a little mishap in the very beginning. So it ate up some of my time. So I apologize for that. But um, basically, it was a, a fire hose of a lot of information. So if you guys have any you know, questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Here's my information and my email.